somebody at my age. <laughs> Dr. Renoon comes from a small town on the Persian Gulf, Karachi, Pakistan by name. It only has about 30 times the number of people that are contained in the entire state of Idaho. He graduated from Aga Khan University Medical College, also in Karachi. His residency training was completed at Westchester Medical Center in New York City, where he was awarded excellence in training and best resident for two years. He was a diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine and the American Society of Nephrology. Together <coughs> with his brother, Naeem, they own and operate the Idaho Kidney Institute with offices in Pocatello, Blackfoot, and Idaho Falls, where they take care of all manner of uh, patients with renal disease. Uh, they are the first Idahoans <coughs> to receive the Ellis Island Medical Medal of Honor, which is given yearly by the National Ethnic Coalition of Organizations, NECL, paying homage to the immigrant experience and contributions made by immigrants and their children. Other recipients of this award include, uh, and there's a lot of them, Yogi Berra, Joe Maggio, Bob Hope, Frank Sinatra, Jane Seymour, Rosa Parks, and Henry Kissinger, plus a couple of past presidents, and even Donald Trump. <laughs> he, he and his wife had two beautiful children. He is fluent in English, Hindi, Urdu, and Punjabi, and has become an outdoor enthusiast uh, since he moved to Portobello. His foundation and entrepreneurship are already legendary. Uh, think of his work after the big earthquake in Nepal. In addition, he is a member of the Rotary Club of Pocatello. And so with all of this, he must be spread rather thin. And when I look at him, I'm sure that he is. <laughs> I wish that you were present at my wedding because there's no one to introduce me. <laughs> Except for my brother, he did a pretty terrible job. <laughs> and he was supposed to be here, I don't think he showed up, he's probably still asleep. Um, well, I'm really excited about today's talk because um, something that's really dear to me, something that I learned over the last many years of doing a lot of relief work in many parts of the world. Um, I'm a kidney doctor, that's my day job, um, but when I'm not working on kidneys, I'm working on this, which is my passion. Um, my talk is mostly geared about my experiences in multiple disaster relief efforts that I've spent over the last few years. Um, so I came up with this topic, which is how do we create sustainable ecosystems in post-disaster communities which are fairly remote, fairly rural? Um, what is the key element? After doing a lot of back and forth and, and spending a lot of time, I realized the key to all of this is women empowerment, especially the women who are living in those communities, because they get marginalized uh, for a multitude of reasons. Most of the uh, pictures that you're going to see in this presentation were taken either by myself or my team members on multiple of our trips. This is one of my favorite photographs of these women who are sitting, waiting during one of our medical camps in um, a small place called Nuggercote, which is about 30, 40 miles uh, minutes out of uh, Kathmandu. So I don't know if anyone here is from Kathmandu, but they'll, they'll know the area very well. So, let me be the first to accept that men really don't know much about women, do we? <laughs> and I've been married for 17 years, and I'm so glad my wife is present while I'm making this claim to myself, but I came across this book that was written 100 years ago, and many of you who are married or intend to get married should get a copy of this. Okay? So it was written in 1913. I'm just going to read the first paragraph and how it relates to what we're going to talk about. So uh, Blanche writes, My dear sir, you are neither as bad nor as good as a fellow as you imagine yourself to be. No doubt you know a good deal about women. Not nearly as much you will in another decade. And that's happened to me, for sure. Because I've been married for over a decade. Now, post-disaster communities that we visited 
um, for earthquakes, floods, wars, internally and externally displaced people. Uh, four different regions of the world where I had presence directly or indirectly were in Nepal after the earthquake in a district called Sindhupalcho. In Chitral in Pakistan, which is the northern, extreme north part of Pakistan, close to the Awan border, first with flooding and then with earthquake in the last six months. Then Calais, France, I don't know if, uh, how many of you know about Calais, it's also called the jungle, which has um, been there for the last 10 years, is uh, first off for a multitude of uh, multiple refugees who flee from different parts of the world, from Iraq to Afghanistan to Syria now, and they end up on this, uh, this small town across the channel from the UK. And then uh, my another experience was very unique, actually, in one of the slums in Bangkok um, of a small kind of an orphanage daycare center of what, what I think is, is kind of a socially marginalized community of children, which is the Rama 8. Now, the group that always gets more and most affected by most of these disasters, whether it's natural or man-made war, earthquake, or flooding, is always women and children are the, under the age of five. Um, and they happen to be marginalized, not only socially, but financially, health-wise, and many other reasons. These are some of the pictures of one of the medical camps that I did in very close to Afghanistan border in a very remote part of Valley of Chitral, beautiful valley um, called Mastu. Now, some of these people also, I don't know if many of you have heard of a place called Kalash. Kalash is a very small valley, and if you ever get a chance, if you remember this, Google it after my talk later in the day, Kalash Valley, and you'll see some starting images of these very small community who live very remotely. There are about three, 4,000 people who are considered to be descendants of Alexander the Great. Uh, I mean, I mean, look at these kids. I mean, they look more like your kids than my kids, right? I mean, they are blue-eyed, fair-skinned, very remote communities who have been living in the same environment for thousands of years. Now, what seems to be the biggest problem for a lot of these communities? Um, well, they're never able to get back on their feet, and I've gone back and forth multiple times. We've delivered hundreds of thousands of uh, material and supplies and, and goods for disaster relief because uh, we are very energized to do so. Um, we happily spend billions of dollars in post-disaster relief, and I'll show you some examples of how we did it and what we've done. But then what happens? Well, we forget about them. You know, how many of you still think every day about what happened in Nepal earthquake in, on April 25th, or in Pakistan on October 25th? You know, it stays in the news, and certainly it kind of dies off. There always seems to be an element of la lack of long-term initiative in these areas. You know, we go in with millions or even billions of dollars of goods, but very few people remain who want to interact in a long-term way to change the lives of those people. In the end, this whole cycle of relief effort truly becomes makes me feel good, and I'm I'm one of the I I, I will be the first to claim yes, it made me feel good to be there. You know, there, we, we help some everybody on the ground, we gave them tents, we gave them food, but there's more to it. And, and this is the picture that, that we took, that's my brother, um, whose hand is on the shoulder of this, this poor guy who we're giving this tent to, and I'm sitting in the back, we all got a smile on our faces, but that poor guy is, you know, we look at his impression, right? Right? He's like in, in an hour shock moment right now. Now, the two main issues with these communities that face long term are health care and education, especially for women and children under the age of five that we talked about. So I'm going to briefly touch on both of these topics. And in those topics, I'm going to kind of give you a different um, point of view. Let's take health care first. Okay? It's a very wide topic, health care spans multiple different ideas and processes, but what do you think is one of the most dangerous events in a human being's life cycle? I, I heard some of you say that, yes. It's childbirth, okay? And anytime we think of childbirth, we think it's a women's problem. It's a female event that a woman has to go through but truly, men have the same stake in this process as women do, and probably equal, okay? 
We go through this as a husband, when our wife is going to labor. We go through it ourselves as a son of a mother who is giving birth to us. Okay? So this becomes a very imminent problem for men that we don't realize we have pretty much almost 50% stake, if not more. Now back in 1930s, um, childbirth used to be very different. Even in U.S., <coughs> a thousand women would die during 100,000 births, okay, which was one in a hundred. Now, it's 18, roughly 18 to 19 deaths per 100,000 women in U.S.A., which is still a big number, considering what you're going to see next. In Japan and most of the developed world, it's about close to five per thousand births. Now, this is a graph which will show you something shocking. Can any of you kind of get the point on this graph? Just raise your hand. Right, yeah? I mean, the developed world, the maternal mortality is going down, mostly followed by Germany, Japan, and Britain, while we've kind of gone up in a different direction. It's not the absolute numbers, but it's the direction that's concerning. There are multiple reasons for that. Some of the reasons are women are giving birth later in their life. We are having more complicated medical problems like you know, lupus, diabetes, hypertension when they're going through this process. And we are also getting more better at collecting data. But regardless of the reasons, we are moving in a different direction than the rest of the world, which seems to be the case in many things. Now, when we take the same statistics and look at some other countries around the world, the numbers are even more drastically different. I mean, thinking about 18 deaths per 100,000 in the USA versus 260 in Pakistan or India or Nepal or double the amount in Afghanistan. Now, this even gets more startling when we take the sub-Saharan and African subcontinent. Imagine 1,000 women per 100,000, and in South Sudan, it's up to 2,000, which is twice the amount where USA was 100 years ago. Now, this is ironic and this is tragic, because it shouldn't be the case. <coughs> the reason why it shouldn't be the case is because the technology and information and the travel and nothing is any different. Those parts of the world are not, not out of our reach. It's just because of sinful lack of intervention on our part as the community of the world, why these numbers are so high. It's just from the fact that we've just forgotten about this problem and many regions of the world is why the numbers are so high. So that was about education and some of these post disaster relief <coughs> areas. Let's just I mean about healthcare. Let's talk about education. When we talk about education we always think about books, schools, literacy, things like that. The, 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 the community that really gets affected the most in these post-disaster communities are actually girls. Because they were affected even before the disaster struck those communities. So if, you ha if you're a family with limited resources, and you have a choice to send your, your son versus your daughter to school, guess what choice are you going to make? And I've seen it myself, when they make these choices, the problem is that a lot of these communities, the way the community has evolved or the world has evolved in that part of the world, the return of investment of them sending their son to school to them seems a lot more than the return of investment on sending their girl to school. Because you know, she's going to get married, she's going to get a go away, whatever be the case, they just don't think it that way which we know is not true. Now the education, at the same time, doesn't always mean both. Because it also means opportunity, confidence, progress, health, economics, and above all, self-worth. So when you hold a girl back from education, you're not only holding her back from reading the books, but you're holding her back from all of these things. That has a huge impact in the future of the community and the nation and generation. 
So before we move further on into my talk and, and we, we talk more specifics about what the solution is, I'm going to walk you through some of those communities where we've worked in the past. I haven't, I haven't been to Haiti, but I wanted to mention Haiti because it's an amazing example of both the disaster effort and what happened after that. So 220,000 people died. We almost spent $13.5 billion in Haiti. Their GDP is lower than it was before the earthquake. The area is not on their feet. You know, this is a picture of a family behind the tarp in their home where a house stood five years ago when the earthquake struck. And this is five years later and $14 billion later. And this is not an isolated example. There are a multitude of examples of multitude of things. There are also examples in Haiti how cholera spread, which wasn't there earlier, but spread when the relief teams came in from different parts of the world, running around with their sleeves rolled up, wanting to do good, but not very well prepared and well equipped. Nepal, where I was, 8,000 people died, but not many people know that 50,000, 50% 50 more households were destroyed in Nepal compared to Haiti. What happened to the $4.2 billion of aid that came to them, or we, we was put in, this is a picture of a school where we did a medical camp and a small educational camp ourselves six months after the earthquake and the $4.2 billion. There are multiple areas of similar examples all over the country. That's another village where the kids have been out of school since the earthquake in one of the villages that we went to. This is a monastery that was demolished after the earthquake, had just been finished right before the earthquake, and the rubble still was there five or six months later when we visited that. Let's talk about Pakistan. The recent earthquake in October, you know, we went in there, our teams went in from Bogotello. We spent a lot of time and effort and resources. We provided to 350 families with tents, food, shelter, the basic needs in this extremely remote part of the world which looked just like this um, two months after the earthquake because of the, the winter coming in. This is how these people were at that time when, when the disaster struck. These are some of the pictures from, from our team that were taken on the ground. I mean, obviously not much resources even during winter. This is a picture of one of the medical camps that we did. My brother was sitting here. We did it in, the, in a camp, and <coughs> we honestly had no idea how many people would show up. Uh, we were expecting 30, 40, 50 people. 450 people walked through our clinic in, next, in six or seven hours while we were there. And most of them were women and children. And it's a really interesting picture. If you look at that woman, she's wearing sneakers. I don't know if it's Nike or what, but <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Now, this is a photograph we took. We, we invited everyone for a group photo end of the day. And there's a reason why I'm showing this picture. What is unique about this photograph compared to this picture when I said 80% of the people who showed up out of 450 were women and children? Mostly men showed up, right, in the end? For the credits. So, so how can we help? Now I've kind of walked you through multiple disaster communities, things that we've done. So how can we help these post-disaster communities after spending billions and billions of dollars in disaster relief effort? Well, the answer is we cannot help them. We truly can't. They have to help themselves. Okay, that's the key point. The moment we bring that notion that we are not the saviors, you know, things will be a lot better. Okay? We can be the moderators, we can be the catalyst, but we are not their saviors. It has to be them. And the key individuals in those communities will always remain women, no matter how you look at it. Okay? If we can empower them socially, not only economically, because there's more to do with this than, than, than economics, we have to empower them socially and economically, and I'm going to talk briefly more about how that works they will truly become community leaders. They will take the whole community and they will rise to them. All we gotta do is to just select a few champions out of that group, give them the tools for engagement, and let them see what they do with it. And I'll show you some examples. This is one of the young ladies who I got to meet and know when I spent two or three days with my team in a very remote village in Nepal, in Sindhupal Chowk district. 
way in the mountains, close to the bed. She was born right here. This, we, are, we are standing at about 8,000 feet right now, right there. Top of the mountain, beautiful, not too far from Tibet. <clears throat> Right-handed monastery that, that fell. Her father was the high priest of the village. Her father died at the spot where she was standing because her home was right in front of it, and it fell right on him. She said, I was born here, my father was born here, and this was dangerous ground because of the aftershocks and everything. So we were talking about, at this time we were discussing, would you want to move? Not only she didn't want to move from there, she wanted to rebuild the monastery and she wanted to serve her people. So imagine if we were able to harness our energy for the long term. Things would be very different. So that's where the idea for 848 came from, which is the solution that I'm here to deliver for all the problems that I've just shown you both. And and, and, and it dawned on me that you know we can keep giving them a handout, but if we just lend our hand and give them tools of engagement and let them get the feeling that they're getting on their feet, and I'll show you how that kind of works in my mind that we've been working on this project, that might change things for, for the good for the long term. So the 848 projects, which I'm going to give a little more detail shortly, is we, we need to create more sustainable and scalable. So they have to be able to sustain themselves, and they, have to have, they should be able to replicate it in multiple other communities in these post-disaster communities by empowering these local women. That's what 848 projects will stand for. Our goals? Well, we really want to create role models in those communities who will eventually become community leaders. And they're among those local women through process of mentoring and stewardship through remote uh, dialogue. So what does social empowerment mean? Well, social empowerment to those communities means, well, we will help them with education and teach them self-worth and gender equality. As much as we take a lot of these things for granted in our communities, they can be taboo subjects there. They are subjects that may not be talked about. But if you bring education and teaching of a woman about self-worth and gender equality, and it doesn't take a whole lot. It's right there. You just got to scratch the surface, and they'll start talking about it. Economical empowerment through vocational training and small business setups. And above all, community building. When you take about eight or ten different women in a community, get them together in a business, it, it turns into a corporate. You know, they can lead the community together. So how we can all bring them together on the same platform, whether you're doing through healthcare, education, or whatever the needs are for that community. And above all, you also not we should be forgetting about disaster planning because these women will remain like that girl Chandra, 22 year old. They will remain there. What are the uh, elements that we can add on to disaster planning and relief effort for those people out there? So the structure of this 848 project works and looks some, something like this. And I see there are some bankers in. Uh, they'll get really excited about loans. So, so it's microfinancing and interest-free loans, which are basically um, in a process of they've been waived off eventually. They're mentors who are based out of USA or independent and successful professional women leaders who mentor these women in, in, in these remote areas. These loans are waived as individuals contribute to a community fund, which is called 848 fund. And I'll show you how that works. We utilize and partner existing healthcare and infrastructure. So we're not really spending a lot of money building bricks and water mortars, but we're investing in, in human capital. That's where the money goes. Our initial focus right now for this project is healthcare and education. And subsequently, we're going to talk more about education and natural resources once the project you know, gets more mature and the community is more aware of how things work. So we have eight mentors in different states. These are all independent women who are successful leaders. They are truly an embodiment of women empowerment individually. And, and, I, and I've gone through the process of you know, talking and getting one from each state. And London is not a state of the United States, but someone lives there, so it happens to be that. Um, so they become mentors to these eight women who live in an extremely remote post-disaster community. But they do have a passion to bring in change in these communities. <coughs> we select those eight women out of you know, 20, 30, or 40 different applications that were laid out. And this is how we then structure them. They become 848. 
So eight mentors here, mentoring eight women over there in a remote community. They get micro, micro loans, interest free, $1,000 a year, which is a lot considering that an average income in those communities is $100 per month household. So if somebody would have come in and given you an interest free loan for the year's worth of what your husband's been making, there's a lot you can do with that. So these eight women, if you, this is a very interesting graph. If you, if you look at these, through what they're doing is they're starting their own businesses, getting empowered, not financially also, but socially, becoming so leaders in their communities. They're being mentored from eight successful entrepreneur leaders, women from the United States and the United Kingdom. Once they're getting on their feet and they have an income generation, they're putting into this eight for eight community fund. And if you look at those yellow graphs on the left where the money that comes into the fund is then put into resources, which is healthcare and education needs of that community. So it just kind of flows together in that community. I'll give you one of the examples of vocational training that we've been starting to do. And we have a project which is mostly community midwife training because they're not doctors and nurses in those communities. So there's a program which is started by one of our partner organizations where we're sending these women to get trained. It's an 18 month course. By the end of the 18 months, they become really very highly specialized in taking care of maternal and child needs during the childbirth in these highly remote access areas. And that's the reason why I mentioned some of the statistics about one of the biggest killers of, um, in, in those communities. The idea is to bring, uh, bring them empowerment. They become community leaders. So if you're delivering somebody's child and you do it directly, <coughs> you have a whole different respect in the community for the, for the community. These, this is what social empowerment comes to be. <coughs> they become service providers, they become community activists, they become educators, and they become community leaders. So you've truly taken a girl or woman like Chandra, who you just saw 22 year old in that community, and he was certainly turned by sending her through this course into a community leader. Now she has a voice, not only for herself, but the rest of the community, especially the women and children in that community. It overall raises the awareness of healthcare needs in that community. And by creating these role models, we're truly embodiment of women empowerment. <coughs> now, this program, which is currently in place through our foundation, is working with our multiple organizations on the ground in, in that country. And this example is from Pakistan where these women are sent for 18 month course to become uh, certified midwives and they get certification. It costs for a candidate $5,000 which is given as a loan for 18 months for those, uh, to those women which is uh, later on waived off because once they come back um, to their communities they start their own private practice. And it's over the last multitude of years, once since they've been doing this project, that organization, they've seen a lot of these women, when they come back to those communities, their actually average income is twice as much as their male counterparts or their husbands in those communities. So it's a whole different game for them. The other ideas of vocational training that we've looked into is solar energy technicians. There's an organization that that's called Barefoot College. It's actually in, in India. And it's been working for the last almost 65 to 70 years where they select these um, grandmas, okay, and, and men, many of the villages, the grandmothers are not that old, they're, they're fairly young in their mid-40s, but they select them because they've gone through the responsibility of their household, and it's called Barefoot College in Rajasthan, and they are sent there for a six-month course where they, and imagine, these women are selected from, the, from very remote areas, they don't know how to write, they don't know how to read, okay, they go there for six months, by the time they come back, they're becoming solar energy technicians. <coughs> and they have a workshop and then they work towards communities energy needs. <clears throat> and while they're gone for six months, the community gets together and builds a whole workshop for them. So they come back and then they have these solar powered stoves, they have electricity for, for their schools and their households and it's a very dynamic project if you ever get a chance take a look at this their website. Cattle and goat farming, pig farming, fish farms, textile and handicraft, which is very interesting. I'm gonna give you an example of, a, of one of our partner organizations now who's been doing it and has done an amazing job. And you can also invest into cash crops in multiple of these areas. Now, <clears throat> so what does an aid for it looks like? Well, these are eight American professional women 
They are working together as mentors to these eight women in a very remote community to socially and economically empower them. This truly is not a philanthropic venture. It's actually a socioeconomic initiative for these communities because that's what we need. You know, it's, so it's truly not giving them a handout, but truly lending, lending them our hand and our expertise and letting them get on their feet. So this is an example of one of the organizations that I got to know recently. Um, its work is in Colombia, South America. Started by a young woman out of college. She is uh, from London, who's now one of our mentors and part of 8 for 8 She went back to Colombia, the country where she was born and grew up. And she spent about a year living with some indigenous villages and getting to do her thesis. End of her thesis, she realized that it's all about what I just talked about, empowering those women to change that community. So she started this, uh, this, uh, this uh, company where she basically gave them loans and got them started making these really amazing bracelets and bags um, and turned into a luxury brand. This is what it looks like right now. These bags are selling for two, three hundred dollars, and this is a lower price tag for a lot of them. That truly really changed the way that community looks a year now, a year after the, she started the program. So this is an, a, a luxury brand out of London that was started in South Colombia in very remote villages. Now, <clears throat> before I end my talk, there's always a behind the scenes theme in a lot of movies, so I'm going to take you behind the scenes of this, this presentation. So that was me when I was getting ready yesterday for this talk. <laughs> and I had a smirk on my face and I took a selfie. And, and not because I was looking good, which obviously I am, <laughs> but the fact that I had an idea. So I was talking to my friend Marco, who was getting my hand, and I was like, Marco, how about we go together and I take you to one of these remote villages, which are extremely remote, and you teach those women how to cut men's hair. Remember, a lot of these areas, men don't have access to cutting their hair. They do it themselves and they do a pretty <laughs> job, you know? <laughs> or they travel to remote towns and pay premium prices, you know, compared to hotel. So I said, if we go there and we teach these women how to cut men's hair, it truly <coughs> will change the dynamic. I mean, imagine a woman with a single blade razor standing at the head of a man, what's more empowering than that, right? <laughs> so that was a behind the scenes moment for me. But, but truly, you know, this was, this was a photograph that my brother and I were in this camp in Chitral that I took, that this whole presentation kind of evolved with. When this woman came up to us, shook our hand, and right now she's in one of those community midwife projects down south in Karachi for an 18-month course of becoming someone. So I think this, this one photograph truly captures, these are our, 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 our physicians who are there, and, and I think this truly captures the essence of, essence of this presentation. So I think I'm going to stop right here. Um, if you guys have any questions. about how do the men feel when these women are taking over the village? Do the men feel, you know, like we're no good anymore because I can't go out and hunt and stuff, so the women are taking over our lives? You know, I think it's high time men to realize we've done a pretty bad job in running this world and society. <laughs> so the sooner they figure that out, the better it is. Um, that's a great question. There's initially some hesitation, but when they, like I said, you know, once you empower them, you're not only letting them earn a living, you're actually loving, uh, teaching them self-worth, gender equality, and that changes the dynamic. I was having this discussion with my wife the other day, I was like, so what if after the child is born, the father comes in, takes over the child, and that's a pretty norm phenomena for him to wake up every night, feed the kid, do the whole thing, change the diapers, blah, 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 right? Shouldn't be any different while the mother has to go to work the next morning. We, we, have, we, we have to understand gender roles and where this whole thing started. Um, those communities are more acceptable, for most part, in understanding that. But we have to give them the tools. So you're not just educating the women, you're, you're also educating the men at the same time. 
especially when she's cutting his hair and she's got a razor in her hand. He, he didn't got a chance. In the book, I Am Mamala, she talks about a lot about her efforts and her father's efforts for educating women and the challenge, the opposition from the Taliban. How do we help them fight that? You know, you, you got to understand, this is a recent phenomenon. You know, the whole Taliban story is was created not too long ago, and it's a very isolated phenomenon in certain communities. Like South America, there are no Taliban. Glad, like to me, right? This part of the Gibraltar, there's none. The answer to that question is, I mean, it's a global war. You know, it's a global war of identity, religion, you know, ideology, whatever you want to call it. Um, the way to really fight is to keep doing what we're doing, is to keep forcing, the, not forcing rather, keep educating ourselves on the needs of those communities and helping them stand on their feet. So I cannot just go there in the Taliban occupied community and build a school because that's been done as we know with, with the other project and they will bomb it down. But it has to be working with the people. We have to, we have to work, keep working on education. Taliban is a whole different story, you know? Um, so thank you for your talk. It's really inspiring, um, and I think you great, give great examples of grassroots um, efforts. I was wondering, um, in your numerous projects, has there ever been any government support or obstruction um, in these areas? You know, that's a great question. The government always looks at you, no matter what part of the world you're in, why are you doing this, right? I mean, when Lane and I were in that, we were haunted by intelligence agencies. I mean, you know, I, um, so they always have that idea of why you're doing this. So give you a simple example. One of our team members, before we got there, wanted to make sure we have internet, okay? Because there was no internet because of a very sensitive area of that part of Pakistan. So he bought a dish, he's setting up a dish internet in that area where we are right now, and he's, where he's talking to his, his client and setting it up, he's like, why don't you point towards the one son because the satellite is there and they'll get a reception. The guy who heard that, you know, so it thought we were a one, a one son spies or, you know, what be the case, so they shut us down, like, drastically. Within, within a day, all our efforts were shut down because of the reasons. So the key to work in any, any community is you have to start with the government. No matter how resistance you get, what would be the case, you have to start with them because there's always a point where you can come together. Um, so afterwards, we learned with the mistakes, and we went back, and my uncle was sitting here in the audience, spent hours uh, dealing with the local government official, but we get through it. I have uh, two questions. First is, I've noticed you're very well dressed, and those oh, shoes thanks. are the dopest I've ever seen. Not right. Where do I get a pair? Right Not yet. <laughs> and then the second question is, I'm kind of curious, you, you've been focusing a lot on this 8 for 8 program. I'm kind of curious if these eight women, if there's any concern of them dropping out after the program, or let's say they come back after their months of training, and maybe they have influences from fathers, husbands, brothers, saying, we don't support you in this. Do they stop, or is there any problem with that, or is it pretty consistent? You know, um, there's, always a, there's always a chance that they can change their mind, right? But it's always how you select them in the first place, right? I mean, even at IFC, I'm sure there's some dropout rates, right? After all the scholarships and everything we do. So there's always going to be a risk. But for most part, they will push through it. Especially when you select a woman who has got children and kids to feed, and she's been in a, in a, in a community where now you're not only giving her tools of um, engagement in terms of work and money, but you've really taught her self-worth and gender equality. You, you, you've taught her that when you talk to your husband, you, you can look it straight in his eyes, right? and you can demand certain things. <coughs> you know, that changes dynamics. I've been married long enough to know that, trust me. Fahim, I've noticed that uh, most of your emphasis has been in small towns, remote areas. Uh, what about the efforts in great big cities like Delhi and uh, the air pollution that's going on there and the, the women there too? I, I think Dr. Rusty Ahmed is a better person to ask because he's from, from India. Um, you know, um, one of the things we, one of the initiatives that our foundation has, and if you ever get a chance, you should come because it's not that far from here. We're trying to bring that to Pocatello. Is we sponsor a film festival, 
So I'll tell you women's film festival. And that's where I'm going to Delhi right now, and women. Um, Delhi has been known for multitude of attacks on women, and there's really an undercurrent of, of that anti-women rape sentiment there. So we recently sponsored uh, a documentary called India's Daughter, uh, which was sponsored, and the film festival just finished in Sun Valley last week. Um, it's, um, it's very deep-rooted. It's, it's cultural. And again, if you look at the grassroot of all of this, it starts from the household. Okay, so I have two daughters and a son, right? And they're ages 9 through 14. So I not only have to teach my daughters to be strong and stand up for their rights, but more importantly, I need to teach my son how to respect the other gender and women. Okay? So if that education and training is missing in a household, whether you're in Pocatello, Idaho, or whether you're in Delhi, eventually the environment would lead to situations like what you're referring to, how women are treated on the streets of Delhi, or some parts of Pakistan, or you know, even in the United States, for that matter. Okay? So I, I think the responsibility lies in our hands as, as parents and institutions, and, and that's why I showed that, those statistics about childbirth because men have equal stakes at the fight against gender equality and understanding. I can't talk about pollution, it's a, it's a very complicated topic. So. Yes, Martin. I wanted to know from you um, about the nutrition of these people. Are they eating well? And uh, what are they doing to take care of their children, nutrition-wise? <coughs> so, <coughs> that's a great question. Um, nutrition, for most part, in many parts of the world, um, especially when I mentioned Nepal, you'll see a size of a small, you know, as compared to other areas. We were in South America, we had a project where we helped out, uh, or we trying to help out, in Panama. Um, the biggest issue in nutrition is the nutrition in the first 24 months of your life, okay? And there are some severe needs, and most of that nutrition is available, but it's a lot of times a lack of education on how they can be fed. I'll give an example of a project that my wife and my kids and I visited in Panama, and if you ever get a chance to Google this organization called Nutri Hoga. Nutri Hoga is out of Panama, it's a phenomenal organization they've been trying for the last 20 years, and they're focused on clinically severely malnourished kids. And I wish I, 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 I wish I knew we were going to ask this question because I had a, a photograph of my son who's nine years old standing next to a nine-year-old kid at that institution. They're about half the size of each other. Early lack of nutrition really severely leads to long-term cognitive and physical um, growth, which you cannot catch up for the next 20 years. Um, so the key is what we're trying to do through education, for, through education, like I said, is not only about education, but about health and nutrition. So once you have these female teachers and female healthcare providers, they're really focusing not only on delivering birth, but also the elements of nutrition, which is mostly about education and, and access. Access is there for most part. Yes, John. A uh, quick question for you. The eight for eight organization, I like the idea. How is it expanding? Are you having those ladies in those organizations, like the initial aid to get the help? Are you having them mentor additional people, say an additional person on their own? And how many different circles eight for eight have been I'll set up? This is, this is just a new process in the last couple of months. So our first project will be in Central and Nepal. I already have the mentors in the United States. Uh, we're still looking for loans if Bank of Idaho was interested. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, it, 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 one element of your question is very interesting, which is how it's scalable. So imagine these eight women who are in Howard, now doing very well in their community. All they got to do is to walk or hike 10 miles, go to the neighboring village, <coughs> and become our ambassadors, and be able to replicate that process. So that, so that is how the scalability and virality can be built into this process, which we've thought of. And then one other follow-up. Uh, organizations like the Red Cross, UNICEF, people like to give lots of money to those. They feel good about themselves. Like you said, it's instant gratification. I've done it. I'm a good person. Let's go away. Well, I've heard lots of stories on NPR about Red Cross with all the money they were given in Haiti and all these projects that supposedly were going to happen. And like you said, several years later, none of these projects have gone anywhere. And the money is nowhere to be accounted for. Is there any way for this to be in, 
conjunction to work with those organizations are those organizations just too much on their own? You know, when I was uh, when I was in Nepal, right after the earthquake, uh, right in the depth of my emotions, so things were very, very up in the air. Um, I was very vocal about it, but one of the things I realized is not really the fault of the organization; it's the flaw in our system. It's a rapid gratification that you know. I mean, earthquake happens, and suddenly we've got 200 ads all over your news and TV and everything, asking for money, and we. And I, I, I've done it myself. I mean, Haiti, I, you know, I quickly, as soon as I saw the ad, and I did it, which is a good thing. You know, we did what we could. But there's a lot of element that needs to be improved in the, in the process of the system, in terms of accountability, how that money gets there, how it's being used. Um, it has to be a public-private partnership. Okay. Um, so we have to do it with the local people on the ground. The biggest problem with the Haiti was, I'll give you an example. I mean, Clinton Foundation spent hundreds of millions of dollars there. <coughs> they built uh, these new settlements and new homes out of uh, the timber of wood in some part of the island, and there's no wood out there. So if your door or your window fell off, three years later, there's no way you can build it again. So, you know, so they turn into slums. So one of the things we realized is in, the, in relief efforts, is that one of the key things is, after you're giving them food and, you know, immediate shelter, is to get to know their local needs. And a lot of those needs were pre-existing to the disaster and how you would work with local communities to expand on those needs. So I think it's a system. To jump back, just before this question, you mentioned that the first 24, 24 months of a child's life are most important for Nutrition. development. Exactly. Um, and so whereas a lot of these midwives are women, um, how do we kind of mitigate that if they are still childbearing? and then all of a sudden they need to be raising their own children, and so how do they then balance their workload with going about and caring to other women who are delivering, and that sort of thing. It, and does that play into, um, I, I don't want to say gender roles, you mentioned that earlier as well, but what kind of gender roles where the man's the provider so that the woman can be at home for extended periods of time doing the most important job, raising children. So how do, how do you kind of mitigate that? Do you, do you then um, train primarily women who are past their childbearing years, or, or I don't know what the kind of how you uh, There's a lot of research out there that shows women are better multitaskers than men are, right? <laughs> there's a reason for that. Um, it's all about dividing gender equal roles, right? I mean, it's not about if I have a child and I have to feed the child and the men have to go out and do it because I can do it in the evening and you can feed the child right now. Right? I mean, there are a lot of different ways to do it. Um, but I think your main question is about if they're, if they're fully in hand with uh, taking care of their, their newly born, how will they fulfill their requirements? Well, it's not any different than one of the women that was a corporate attorney in USA who now happens to have a, have a, have a child, you know? So it's just, it's, that's the way they, they go to it. Um, Any other questions? Yes. Um, so, as you're going out to these small remote areas, and you're working mostly with women and educating women on how to do these these things and medically provide for other women, do you find any men who are offended by this or that that also want to learn? Do you ever run into situations like that? You know, this program has been enough for me not to give you any exact events, but I can give you a generic answer to that. Um, one of the reasons why we take um, maternal care and uh, midwives is because obviously it's one of the highest return on investment when you do small interventions that you can really change the outcome. When, with our experience with the organization that has started this project over the last five or ten years, um, one of the things that they really realize is, and um, is that once you deliver someone's baby, okay, in that remote community, you're really a superhero, and you've done it successfully. Especially, I don't know if many of you have seen this ad. There's an ad that used to be on internet and TV. It shows a man in, in some remote part of India who's walking on his hand for a long time. And finally, he gets to a temple, and he's walking on his hands, okay, like hand walking, right, up and down. And he gets to a temple, and then finally he kneels down and stands and prays. And somebody asks him, why are you doing this? He's like, 
this is my, I, I made this fact that once I have a child who crosses this fifth year of life, I will do this as a prayer or what you could do. That was his first child out of six who were born who survived the fifth year of life. Okay, if you ever get a chance, Google that, that was very, very powerful. So, so that whole transition for women, so that's how they give them the leadership role in the community. So yeah, I mean, there'll be men who will, you know, raise hands and, you know, create ruckus about it, but for most part, it's a very empowering position for a woman to be in. I was born here, but you know my birth certificate is going to be challenged. Um, so you mentioned that uh, a lot of the people in these communities that were at risk were the women and the children under five. You've talked a lot about what you've been doing to help the women, but what have you been doing to work with the kids under five that are in danger and stuff? So, so that's a great question. So, so one of the things, I'll give you an example of this. One of the other projects that we had, some of you might remember a couple of years ago, we, we, we were working on the smokeless stoves. And that came from one of our other trips when we realized that a lot of these households were exposed to smoke in the household. Um, and, and the highest uh, mortality or morbidity, which is getting sick or getting dying, was in women getting lung disease and these child getting malnourished and lack of growth with exposure to the smoke for these kids who were with their with their with their mother during the daytime. So we worked towards smokeless stoves and we are still in the process of helping scale that it's a huge initiative globally about it. It all comes down to educating and helping the mother understand the, the risk in the environment. Okay, the risk could be the smoke in the kitchen. The risk could not be getting the nutrition on time. And the risk could be that they just don't have the, the, the youth in the community to be able to make, change certain way the culture is set, way, right? Um, so clean water, we have world expert on vaccination sitting there. Um, Dr. Rafi, I mean vaccination is a huge deal in the first five years. I mean, let alone, I mean, especially polio, see, you're here. Polio has been a huge initiative in getting um, vaccinated. So I myself, there's not a whole lot I can do, but if we can educate a mother about the risk that their child will have to face in the first two years of their life from vaccination, infectious disease, to nutrition, and to the environment, there's a lot they can do. Hopefully a simple question, but I'm just curious. You can hit me hard, Kevin. Uh, why eight in particular? <laughs> I knew someone was going to ask eight. Why is that question? Um, eight sounds better than nine. More manageable than ten. Um, the reason I got it started was I was looking for, I started my search for something like this um, locally here. Um, and I kept going back and forth on the numbers. Um, but to me, eight just sounded right. And I get right. the sense that if it could be 800, yeah. that might be better. So yeah. do you have plans to grow this yes. number? Yeah. So eight is a, is a small, so most of these communities, remember our communities, uh, where there are 50 households, like Village Angry has 50 households in Nepal. All 50 households were demolished, they were destroyed in the earthquake. We built 13, 12 or 13 homes there now, we still have to build more. Um, it's, so, so we wanted to keep a number which is manageable for us, but it's also scalable and replicable. So if these eight women in that village of Yang or Kuki household can do this, then they can go to the neighboring village and teach other eight women how to do that. And if you multiply it by ten times, you know, that's how you can get the scalability. So, that was a question. That was a tough one. So I think that's <clears throat> that's about it, right? Thank you so much everyone for your time.